Hello everyone and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti, the Jamalpur Years. And this is a reading of the 18th chapter titled Tantra Guru. It is impossible to conquer a crude idea and to replace it by a subtle idea without a fight. Hence, Tantra is not only a fight, it is an all-round fight. It is not only an external or internal fight, it is both. The practice for raising the Kula Kundalini is the internal sadhana of Tantra, while shattering the bondages of hatred, suspicion, fear, shyness, etc. by direct action is the external sadhana. When those who have little knowledge of sadhana see the style of this external fight, they think that the tantrics moving in the cremation ground are a sort of unnatural creature. Actually, the general public has no understanding of these tantrics. When Jata Shankar arrived in Amra for his first DMC in April 1958, he found it all very strange. He could not understand why these people were dancing and singing all the time. He was not aware, perhaps, that the Margis from his hometown of Madhepura also found him rather strange due to his rough speech, his undisciplined and often odd behavior, and his habit of wearing the orange robes, Rudraksha beads, and long hair of a wandering ascetic, despite not being a monk at all. A few hours before delivering his DMC discourse, Baba called Yata Shankar into his room and told him to sit in meditation posture. He looked at him intensely for several moments and then informed him that he had been a great worshipper of Kali in his previous life. Are you ready to learn Tantra Sadhana again in this lifetime? Baba asked. When the curious Yata Shankar answered yes, Baba raised his hand and Yata Shankar saw lightning explode from his guru's forehead. Are you sure? Baba asked. Will you be able to meditate on a dead body? Or will you run in fear? Trembling at this display of Baba's supernatural power, but excited at the prospect of becoming a real tantric, Jata Shankar assured Baba that he was ready. Very well then, Baba said. Come to Jamalpur next month, on the day of the new moon, and I will initiate you there. A few weeks later, Jata Shankar arrived in Jamalpur, accompanied by his friend Haribalab who was also a new margi. When they reached the Jagrati, Kedarnath Sharma, a hard-nosed policeman and senior acharya, scolded him for bringing Hari Balab and suggested forcibly that both of them return home. Angered by this rude reception, Jata Shankar went to the station to buy the return tickets. But in the early evening, he went to Baba's house in Rampur Colony and planted himself in front of the veranda in protest. When Baba opened the door to leave for field walk, he greeted Jata Shankar and Hari Balab affably and invited them to accompany him to the field. Before Jata Shankar had a chance to voice his protest, Baba added, And don't mind Kedarnath. He is very strict, but he is also a great devotee. Baba led them to the Tantra Pita formed by the three palm trees, while Hari Balab waited at the tiger's grave. Baba initiated Jata Shankar into the first of four lessons of Kapalic meditation. Then he initiated Hari Balab, who would later become the first known Margi to receive all four lessons. When the initiations were complete, Baba gave them some further guidelines for their practice. The meditation was to be done either in a cremation ground or a graveyard between the hours of 12 midnight and 3 in the morning. They were to practice every night until the next new moon. This was to be known as a compulsory period. Thereafter, they were only required to practice on the night of the new moon, the darkest night of the month, though they had the option of doing the meditation on other nights as well during the stipulated hours. He explained to them that the main purpose of this sadhana was to overcome the fear complex, 
If practiced properly, at least 50% of their fear complex would disappear within a short period, and the rest gradually over time. One side effect of the practice, he warned, was the possible development of occult powers. They were, however, expressly forbidden to ever use such powers, should they develop them. Then Baba touched each of them on the forehead and put them into a state of trance. Though most Kapalics would practice once a month on the new moon night, once their compulsory period was over, Jata Shankar would maintain his nightly practice for a number of years. News of Jata Shankar and Hari Balab's initiation into Tantra Sadhana spread quickly among the disciples. Many of them soon approached Baba with requests for initiation, despite the widespread public misapprehensions concerning Tantra. Although it was accepted everywhere in India that Shiva, India's most popular spiritual figure, was the father of Tantra, as well as the father of yoga, Tantric yogis were reputed to be mysterious and dangerous figures. They were generally believed to freak in the forests and cremation grounds, possess strange supernatural powers, and practice occult rites that included dead bodies and skulls, bearing many similarities to what is known in the West as black magic. A good example of these public fears can be seen in the story of Aniruddha's initiation into Ananda Marga. Aniruddha was a successful contractor in Bhagalpur, who by his own admission, drank several bottles of wine per day and only ate vegetables once or twice a year. When he went to Jamalpur in late 1955 to see Baba for the first time, Baba recited a detailed list of his bad habits and told him that he should give them up immediately. Aniruddha was worried that Baba might hypnotize him, but he could not stop himself from visiting Baba, and within a month, he had given up meat and alcohol and going to bars, seemingly against his own volition. His wife, who was shocked by this radical change in habits, asked his friends to take him to their regular haunts and tried to persuade him to go back to his old ways. They obliged her, even offering him a large building contract if he would give up his new life. But Aniruddha held firm. He soon brought his brother Harinder to Ananda Marga and afterwards his father, Nara Singh, at whose place Baba would later give problem of the day. At the beginning, Aniruddha was terrified of Baba. He considered him a mighty tantric, though that didn't stop him from visiting him. In an interview, he described the following incident from his first field walk. Baba asked me if I wanted to see something. I told him, if you want to show me, then show me. He asked me again. When I agreed, he told me to close my eyes and not open them until he said it was okay. Then he lit his flashlight and told me to open my eyes. What do you see, he asked. There was a person standing there about seven feet tall. Baba revolved his flashlight, and the person started growing until he was 30 feet tall, as high as a palm tree. I bent down and caught Baba's feet, terrified. I offered him 100,000 rupees to spare me. Will you make me a palm tree also, I asked. Baba said, don't worry, I won't kill you or make you a palm tree. Just hold on to my feet. Then Baba made the person shrink to six feet and called him to come over. That fellow had laughed like a giant when he heard me offer Baba money to spare me. Both were smiling, and I thought both were great tantrics, and that he might be a ghost whom Baba had summoned to kill me. Don't worry, Baba said. He is Kalikananda. He told him to go, and the fellow disappeared suddenly. Then Baba said, it has become late. We must return now. Otherwise you will miss your train. Then I will miss my train, I said. I am feeling extremely hungry. Ordinarily, I would have eaten two meals in this time. Baba said, I know. In this span of time, you would have eaten kebab, chicken, eggs, and liver. I was thinking that Chandranath must have told him this, 
He looked at me and laughed. No, no. No one has told me. So you want me to believe that you are God, I said. That no one has told you these things. That you knew my name and place without anyone telling you. No, no. Don't think for a moment that I will believe you. Baba just laughed and told me to catch my train. I am feeling too hungry to catch my train, I said. Then go and eat. The train won't leave the station until you've finished. I just laughed and said, Anything you say, if you say the train won't leave, then it won't leave. We walked back, and the Margie who had met me in the station was waiting on the bridge. Baba told him to take me to a restaurant first, and then bring me to the station. Then Baba told me to come tomorrow. No, I won't come, I said. You must. I said, how much will it take to get you to leave me alone? I don't want any money. Then why do you want me to come back? Baba just smiled. The Margie took me to a pure veggie restaurant. I said, what is this place? I don't eat this kind of food. He said, all the Margies eat here. I said, I am not a Margie. I don't eat this grass and stuff. He ordered some pakoras and other spicy things. The manager came up and said, Don't worry. You have time. The train is an hour late. I gave that person money to purchase a first-class ticket. He told me that Margis travel by third class. I told him the Margis can go to hell. Much of the public reticence toward Tantra was due to the branch of Tantra known as Avidya. For several millennia in India, Avidya Tantrics had been cultivating secret practices, often for the express purpose of developing occult powers. In many cases, they would use these powers for personal gain or even to do harm to their enemies. Baba had talked about Avidya practices on occasion with the disciples. It was commonly assumed among them that he was a master of Avidya as well as Vidya Tantra, though he would not teach it to them his rationale being that Avidya Tantrics did not practice their arts in order to attain God. He did, however, teach them how to deal with Avidya Tantrics should they come face to face with one. First of all, they were to use their Guru Mantra. He assured them that the Avidya Tantrics powers would have no effect over them if they did. Many Avidya Tantrics, he said, tried to frighten people by using their mental powers to drop stones or other objects on a house or move things within that house, thus frightening the people who live there. In such cases, you will find the Avidya Tantric hiding somewhere nearby, since such powers do not work at a long distance. You should look for him, catch him, and shake him to break his concentration. Once their concentration is broken, their power cease to function. But don't forget that this is also an art. Do not interfere with it unnecessarily. Otherwise, this art will disappear. There was a number of incidents where Margis came under attack from Avidya Tantrics and defended themselves as Baba had instructed. One such attack even led to an unexpected initiation. A disciple from Dumka, Basant, was one of the first to learn Kapalic meditation from Baba. Soon after he returned home from Jamalpur, he started hearing stories from the neighbors about strange sounds coming from a cremation ground at night, babies crying, strange animal cries, and other unusual and frightening sounds. Asant decided to start going to that cremation ground to practice his Kapalic sadhana in the hope that it might be the work of some Avidya Tantric taking it both as a challenge and an adventure. Sure enough, Vasan's suspicions proved to be well-founded. A powerful local Avidya Tantric by the name of Sudanchu had been using that cremation ground for his nightly practice. When he noticed that Vasant had begun meditating there as well, he began using his Avidya techniques to frighten him away. Vasant, however, continued steadfast in his meditation protected by the ritual barrier that encircled him, part of the first lesson of Kapalik. 
When the terrifying noises and flying objects did not have any effect, the Avidya Tantric finally resorted to Mantragat, a direct attack with special mantras designed to inflict harm on a person through the concentrated application of psychic force. Vasant repelled the attack with his Guru Mantra, causing a boomerang effect that knocked Sudanchu to the ground, after which Sudanchu fled. The next day, Sudanchu showed up at Vasant's house, intent on learning the name of the Guru of this man, who was able to repel with ease his most ferocious attack. After hearing about Baba, Sudanchu became eager to take initiation. Vasant made the arrangements and brought him to Jamalpur. When Sudanchu was ushered into Baba's room for personal contact, Baba grabbed him by the ear and started scolding him for misusing his avidya powers and attacking one of his disciples. After extracting a promise from him to stop his avidya practice, Baba informed Sudanchu that he was withdrawing the powers he had attained through avidya sadhana. You will no longer need them, he said. From now on, you will be a practitioner of Vidya Sadhana. The mystery and the aura of the supernatural that surrounded such practices made it natural for common people to be afraid of tantrics, and just as natural for the margis, especially the younger ones, to be interested in Kapalic initiation. After Harinder and Sudhir, both in their early twenties, learned Kapalic, they asked Baba if it would give them occult powers. Baba replied, After doing anything, you gain something, either good or bad. You will also gain something by doing Kapalik. But I will seize whatever powers you gain. When the time comes for you to utilize those powers for social service, I will release them, but not until then. They should only be utilized for service. Although the lessons will remain confidential, Baba would soon demystify tantric practices through a series of discourses in which he showed that Tantra was the philosophy of the indigenous peoples of India and the original source of all yogic practices. In his second Aryu discourse, entitled Tantra and the Indo-Aryan Civilization, delivered just before he began teaching Kapalik Sadhana, Baba stated, The greatest difference between the Aryans and the non-Aryans was in their outlook. The Aryans wanted to establish themselves on the basis of their racial superiority, whereas the non-Aryans, following the precepts of Tantra, did not recognize any distinctions between one person and another. Everyone was a human being. All belonged to the same family, the family of Shiva. Here it is necessary to remember that Tantra is not a religion. It is a way of life, a system of sadhana. The fundamental goal of the sadhana is to awaken the quiescent spiritual force of the individual, the Kula Kundalini, and direct it upward, stage by stage, until it emerges in Brahma Bhava, or cosmic consciousness. Tantra is a science of spiritual meditation, or sadhana, which is equally applicable to anyone, no matter what their religious affiliation. Tantra is certainly older than the Vedas. Despite Baba's efforts to demystify Tantra, the aura of mystery remained, fed by the many unusual experiences that the disciples shared with one another as they made their way deeper into the Tantric tradition. One night, Pashupati, an Acharya from Bhagalpur, went to the cremation ground in Trimohan to practice his Kapalik Sadhana. As he was beginning his meditation, he saw a light approaching. He thought at first that it might be a policeman, an obstacle that Kapalics would have to learn to avoid when they went to the burial grounds or cremation grounds at night. But when the light reached him, it passed by and vanished. No one was there. A few days later, he went to Jamalpur and mentioned the incident to Baba. It was a devayoni, a luminous body, Baba told him. Normally, you can't see them because they lack the solid and liquid factors. But sometimes sadhakas can see them if their minds are subtle enough, especially on very dark nights. It was unusual what you saw. They are often attracted to Kapalik's when they go for meditation. 
the spiritual vibration attracts them. They can even help sadhakas at times. Other Kapalik soon reported incidents where they were helped at the time of Kapalik by strange lights. One group of three Acharyas had to cross a stream on the night after a heavy rain in order to reach the cremation ground, but they had trouble locating a spot shallow enough to cross. Suddenly, a strange light appeared and hovered over the stream. As they stared at it, unable to find an explanation for what they were seeing, the light began to move downstream. At a certain point, it stopped and hovered there. They remembered what Baba had said about Devayonis and tried to cross. To their surprise, they found that the stream was only knee-deep at that spot. As soon as they reached the other side, the light disappeared into the distance. They reached the cremation ground and completed their sadhana. When they started walking back, the light returned and guided them back to the same spot. On another occasion, Pashupati was trying to cross the river Gerua, but was unable to find the crossing. After trying for half an hour, he was startled to see the whole area suddenly illuminated by a soft effulgence, as if it were a moonlit night, with the moon only shining on that particular area. With the help of this light, he was able to find the path of stones that he was looking for. When he reported the incident to Baba some days later, Baba told him that there had been a number of murders on that riverbank. Hence, some Siddhas, a type of Devayoni, were keeping watch there to help any Kapaliks who might need their guidance. Shitij, the Acharya who along with Kedarnath Sharma started Anandamarga in Ranchi, recounted the following experience. I used to travel from Ranchi to Danbar every Friday night. I would stay in the waiting hall at the station and then take the 4 a.m. train to Sindri, which arrived about 5. Then I would give initiations and lessons to the students in the Sindri hostel till 7.30. The Margis there will make all the arrangements during the week. One night in the waiting hall, I dreamed that there was a tantric of fair complexion residing below the hall who had killed the child. The child's mother came to me to ask for my help, knowing that I was also a tantric. I approached that tantric and told him that since he had not given life to the child, he had no right to take it. He replied that he wanted two bodies and that my body would be the second. Go ahead and try, I said. I am the son of Anandamurti. I started doing meditation. Baba appeared in my meditation and taught me a two-word mantra. He told me that if I would touch the tantric on his Agya Chakra and say the mantra, it would put an end to him. I did so, and the tantric died. Then the police got annoyed with the two deaths. I decided to run away. I grabbed my luggage and ran down the stairs and caught a taxi. Then I woke up. What a funny dream, I thought. While returning from Sindri, I met Baburam Singh in the station. I didn't like him, so I used to avoid him whenever possible. When he saw me, he said in a sarcastic tone, How are you, Adraji? I am fine, I said, ignoring the insult. I am going to the office now. I don't have time for you. He said, How is your Ananda Murgi? I got wildly angry. The person whom I respect, you are insulting? You will realize him when you are bedridden. Never say this again. He said it again. I was beside myself with anger. I remembered the mantra I had received in the dream and used it on him. Then I went home and fought with my wife, with my son, and later on at work with my boss. Then I returned home that evening. I knew I had to meditate properly to get my composure back, but I could not concentrate. I berated myself for having lost my temper knowing that it was the cause of my troubles, and resolved to go out and do some prachar. At that moment, Baburam knocked on my door. When I opened it, he was irate. He asked me if I honestly thought I could make him a margi by force. I've had a 104-degree fever 
ever since I met you this morning, he said. Then he stormed off in a rickshaw. I realized my mistake and decided to go to Jamalpur. When I got there, I met Pranay. He told me to stand by the side of the step when Baba came out for his walk. I waited there until Baba came out and did Namaskar. He accepted my Namaskar and asked me how I was doing. Then Baba said that only those who were Kapalik could go with him on his walk. Ram Tanuk, Lalan, and I went with Baba. When we reached the field, Baba started lecturing me. He said that those who practice Kapalik grow very strong mentally and physically. Their mental power lies at Agya Chakra and their physical power at Anahata Chakra. When these powers get concentrated, a Kapalik gets the strength to kill three persons, physically or mentally. You must never misuse this power, he said. I caught Baba's feet and begged him to forgive me. I have committed a great mistake, I told him. I was unable to tolerate what that man said. Give me back the mantra I gave you in your dream, Baba said. I offered it that night in Guru Puja. Afterward, I had a very good meditation. The next day, I was mentally and physically sound again. When I got back to Ranchi, I went to meet Baburam and apologize. He had also recovered, and I was surprised to hear that he wanted to take initiation. A few days later, Baba came to Kedar's place. I asked Baburam if he would like to meet Baba. At first he declined, but Kedarnath was able to convince him to go. I took him and sat him close to Baba. Baba came and gave a talk. Baburam was not looking at him or even lifting his head. I thought I had made a mistake by bringing him. Baba had said in the past that the Guru cannot tolerate anybody's ego. If he shows ego, the Guru neglects him. But when Baburam raised his head, I could see the tears falling like a shower. Afterward, he kept begging me to take him to Baba. He was crying continuously. After that, he became a strong Margi and a staunch follower of Yama Niyama. In the Tantric tradition, the Guru often tests the disciples, using these tests to help them overcome their various mental weaknesses. While most of Baba's tests fell within the range of the disciples' normal experience, he sometimes used the video techniques to add to these challenges. Dilip Bos, who was 20 when he took initiation at the end of 1954, recalled some of the tests Baba had put him through when he was barely out of his teens. Once, Baba asked me to meet him at the tiger's grave late at night. I went there, but there was no trace of Baba. It was about 11.30 or 12. Then Baba arrived from somewhere and begged my pardon for having come so late. He told me he had forgotten something and asked me whether or not I could fetch it for him. I told him I would do my level best. He said that he had left a box of matches near the door of the Kali temple at the top of Kali Pahar. It didn't even occur to me that he didn't smoke. Why should he be carrying a box of matches? Now you can imagine having to climb Kali Pahar at that time of night in the pitch black without a torch. It took me about an hour, but I did it. I came to know later that these were his tests. That was the test of fear. He also took a test of shame that also took place at night when we went for field walk. There was a tea stall near the railway line. The shop belonged to someone named Hira. He asked me if I could bring him a cup of tea, and I said that I could, but he put a condition. I had to go totally naked. I hesitated at first. Then I thought that there was no question of disobeying him, since I considered him the pole star of my life. But it was the strangest thing. I passed many people on the way, and none of them even gave me a second glance. I went to Hida's shop, bought the tea, and brought it for him. Neither Hira nor anyone else said anything or looked at me in any unusual way. It was as if no one could see that I was naked. Another time, in the middle of 1955, he asked me to make a circuit of the field with his shoes in my mouth. I did it without hesitation. When I returned to the grave, he told me that he had kept some good food for me. When I looked at where he was pointing, I saw a dead body 
in an advanced state of decomposition, lying in the ground in front of the grave. He scooped out some flesh from its belly and asked me to eat it. That time I really felt that I would not be able to do it. Then he told me that I would have to give up all feelings of revulsion. He asked me to close my eyes and take his name and eat it. I did it and it tasted very sweet. When I opened my eyes, the dead body was gone. He took many such tests. He showed me many strange apparitions that appeared in front of us and then touched his feet. These things took place in front of my eyes. Once Baba explained to Kishun that Avidya gurus use such methods to help their disciples overcome propensities such as hatred and revulsion, propensities that are very strong and difficult to overcome. I don't ask people to do this anymore, Baba told him, but I used to carry some sugar candy with me, and sometimes with the help of Maya, I will make it look like a human corpse and ask them to eat its flesh. This was to destroy the bondages of Satripu and Astapasha in their minds. Afterward, I would ask them how it tasted, and they would tell me it was sweet. When a teenage Rameshananda first asked Baba for Kapalik initiation, Baba told him he was too young. Rameshananda kept pestering him. One evening, while sitting on the tiger's grave, Baba told him that he would grant his request, but first he had to pass a little test. Baba said, Go to the tree over there. Under it you will find a dead body. Eat a little of its flesh, and then come back. The tree was about 200 meters from the grave. It was pitch dark at the time. Being very young, I was a little afraid of the dark. I started walking toward the tree, but as I did, I felt overcome by fear. I battled it as best as I could and kept walking until I reached the tree. I couldn't see any dead body, but there was a strong odor of decaying flesh, so I was sure it was there. I got down on the ground and groped around with my hands until I found it. It was so decomposed that I was able to grab some flesh with only a little pressure. The smell was so bad that it took an enormous effort to put it in my mouth. But as soon as it touched my tongue, I found it very sweet. I had never eaten anything so delicious in my life. The smell also disappeared, and at that moment my fear evaporated. When I came back to the tiger's grave, Baba was laughing loudly. I asked him to initiate me, but he told me that first, I had to start a school in a certain part of Bihar. I went there and was able to open a school without too much difficulty. Two months later, on May 4, he initiated me into Kapalik. One day, Haraprasar Haldar passed by Baba's office looking very distraught. When Baba asked him what the matter was, he explained that his cousin Santu had died and that the two of them had been very close. He had returned home for the cremation but had not been able to see his cousin's body before it was cremated. This was also weighing on his mind. He regretted the fact that he had not been able to see him one last time, even dead. Baba paused for a moment and then asked, Do you want to see him? Is that possible? It is possible. Come to the field with me tonight. When they reached the field that evening, Baba sat down on the Englishman's grave and told Haraprasad to get ready. He was going to show him his dead cousin. He asked him to remove his clothes. Haraprasad stripped down to his loincloth. Remove your loincloth as well. Haraprasad reluctantly obeyed. Baba taught him a mantra and asked him to repeat it while he walked towards the tiger's grave, a distance of about 20 meters. He warned him that when he saw his cousin, he must not touch him under any circumstances, otherwise he would be in danger. Haraprasad took a few steps towards the grave, but he became so afraid that he forgot the mantra. He came back and informed Baba that he had forgotten it. Baba reminded him and told him again to move toward the tiger's grave. Haraprasad took a few steps in that direction, but again he forgot the mantra. This time Baba started scolding him. Fool, if you cannot remember this mantra, how will you work in the organization? Put your sandal in your mouth and rub your nose on the ground. Haraprasad did as he was ordered. 
On the third try, he was able to keep chanting the mantra as he walked toward the grave. When he got within a few steps, he suddenly stopped and blanched, feeling as if someone had thrown a bucket of cold water over him. Standing in front of the grave, he saw his cousin Santu. The two cousins looked at each other for a minute or two without speaking. Haraprasad began to sob. Then he returned to the Englishman's grave. Baba ordered him to do Sastang Pranam and put back on his clothes. Now tell me, Haraprasad, what did I teach you today? When Haraprasad could not answer, Baba said, I taught you to overcome shyness, repulsion, and fear. You overcame shyness when you removed your dress. You overcame repulsion when you took your shoe in your mouth. And you overcame fear when you met your dead cousin, Santu. Surendra received this Kapalic initiation a few days after the new moon in January 1960. His compulsory period lasted 24 nights, during which time he had difficulty putting up with the frigid temperatures. On the final night, he went to the cremation ground with Harinder of Trimohan. When the two young men had finished and were heading back, Surendra exclaimed, Thank God that hell is over. Now I only have to practice this sadhana once a month. What a trial I have been through. Harinder was quick to warn his friend, Be careful what you say, Surendra. If Baba comes to know about it, he will be upset with you. Don't worry, Harinder. I won't repeat it to anyone. Anyhow, Baba is in Jamalpur. He is probably sleeping right now. A few days later, Baba left Jamalpur to conduct the DMC. Along the way, his train stopped in Ekchari Station, near Trimohan. Surendra and Harinder were among the huge crowd that gathered in the station to have Baba's darshan. A few minutes after the train pulled in, they were called to Baba's compartment. After asking how they were, Baba said, You know, a few days back, on the new moon night, I happened to be sleeping when a gentle breeze reached me from Trimohan, carrying with it the conversation of two Acharyas. Baba repeated word for word their conversation and then said, Surendra is in a city of Sadaka and very regular in his Kapalik Sadhana. How could he speak such contemptuous words? I began to doubt the message I received from that breeze. That is why I called you both, to assure myself that Surendra never spoke such words. Surendra begged Baba's forgiveness and received this Guru's smile in return. The disciples had known that Baba was a Tantric Guru long before he began teaching Kapalik Sadhana. As Astana had discovered, somewhat shockingly, on the morning of the death demonstration, Baba was not only a loving master, a devotional figure, and a constant source of inspiration, he was also a stern taskmaster and a fierce disciplinarian who would not hesitate to punish his disciples when they deviated from the proper path. This side of the Tantric Guru, traditionally absent in the ordinary yogic or Vedic Guru, has been an essential part of the Tantric tradition for millennia perhaps most famously embodied in the story of Milarepa and his guru, Marpa. Rather than simply teaching their disciples the spiritual practices and encouraging them to move forward on the path, tantric gurus, as Baba explained in a 1960 DMC discourse, take meticulous care to ensure that their disciples follow their teachings. If they discover that their disciples are negligent in any way, they compel them to practice more painstakingly by applying circumstantial pressure. The preceptor must also be nigraha, capable of inflicting punishment, and anugraha, capable of bestowing grace. One who punishes only, or one who bestows grace only, is not an ideal preceptor. While Baba had always been prompt to use whatever means necessary to ensure that his disciples followed the correct path, this side of his personality started coming out even more to the fore about the time he began teaching Kapalik Sadhana. Sometime in 1958, he started openly calling attention to his disciples' mistakes in general darshan, something he had refrained from doing until that point. Several of the senior disciples 
had already been forewarned of the changes. Many of the devotees who come here to join in the devotional singing and meditation are not following Yama Niyama strictly, he had told them. From now on, I am going to become more strict in this regard. Otherwise, when the crowds become very large, it will be difficult to control them. The work of the Guru is not only to give blessings, but also to give punishment for the welfare of the disciples. Without punishment, one cannot follow the spiritual path properly. Baba started implementing the new policy the very next Sunday. During one of these Sunday darshans, Baba asked a young student from Musafapur to approach his cot. After asking him a question or two about his studies, Baba said, Now tell me, at night you go into your cupboard and take out a bottle. After you've had a drink, you hide it in the cupboard again, and then you feel drowsy and neglect your studies. Just what is in that bottle that you are drinking from every night? The boy hung his head, unable or unwilling to look at Baba. Tell me, tell me, Baba said. But still the boy didn't answer. Then Baba started scolding him openly. This boy secretly keeps wine in his hostile cupboard and drinks it at night when he thinks no one is looking. Boy, your secret is out. Whenever you do any action, my two eyes are watching you. Do you think that what you are doing is right? You are falling behind in your studies and misusing and abusing your parents' money. What will happen if some other boy sees you and starts copying your bad behavior? Is this how you follow Yama Niyama? Baba leaned forward and touched him between the eyebrows. The boy fell senseless to the ground. By stimulating the Agya Chakra, Baba told the disciples, there has been some hormonal secretion from his pineal gland. Due to this, the boy has gone into samadhi. This hormonal secretion of the pineal gland is described as Amrita Rasa, nectarian hormone. It is a divine intoxication. After some minutes, he will return to his senses. When he returns from samadhi, you people will see that his eyes are red as if he were drunk. But this has nothing to do with wine. It is a divine intoxication. After 15 to 20 minutes, the boy came out of his trance. His eyes were swollen and reddish. How did you enjoy this kind of intoxication, Baba asked. Which do you find more enjoyable, this or drinking wine? Baba, the boy replied, this is a thousand times better than wine. Yes, when a person drinks wine, he loses his sense. His mind becomes crudified. It becomes blind. But when a person goes into samadhi, he becomes refreshed. His consciousness is illuminated. After the boy had promised not to drink again, Baba told him, Do more sadhana, and you will be able to enjoy samadhi and the hormone secretion from the pineal gland. It will give you more concentration of mind, which will help you with your studies. Don't waste any more of your father's money purchasing wine. Remember, for samadhi, you don't have to spend a single paisa. In another general darshan, Baba asked a police officer to stand up. Baba started explaining to everyone that this disciple had heard that Baba went to sleep at 12 and got up again at 4. So he had started drinking during those hours, thinking that Baba wouldn't know. Do you think Paramapurusha sleeps at this time? Baba asked him. Do you think you can hide from him? Water, earth, fire, this whole planet, everything is an agent of Paramapurusha. You cannot hide from him no matter what you do. So it is better you admit your fault and take punishment. The policeman admitted that he had been drinking secretly at that hour. Baba ordered him to rub his nose on the ground and made him promise that he would never drink again. On another occasion, a government officer was singing a devotional song at the beginning of General Darshan. He had a beautiful voice and the song brought tears to the eyes of many of the devotees. When he was finished singing, Baba said, You see, he is singing a devotional song and bringing tears to everyone's eyes. Yet in the office, he is accepting bribes. What kind of hypocrisy is this? Baba turns his attention to the officer. Is it not true that you accept bribes? Reduced to tears, 
though not of devotion. The officer admitted that he had been accepting bribes in exchange for government favors. In yet another darshan, Baba scolded a different police officer so severely for victimizing an innocent person that the officer started shaking visibly for all to see. If you act like an animal, then perhaps I should give you the body of an animal. Afterward, a number of disciples became scared that Baba might actually transform them into an animal. Word spread quickly that Baba had begun exposing the disciples' wrongdoings in public. As a result, attendance at General Darshan dropped precipitously. Over the next several months, the disciples became extremely conscious of their behavior, not wanting to give Baba any pretext to expose them in front of their fellow devotees. Many of those who were not following the precepts of Yama Niyama thought it more prudent to stay away. One day, Acharya Chandradeva went into Baba's room to confess a mistake he had made and ask for punishment, thinking it was wiser than to wait for Baba to point it out in front of everyone. However, Baba chose not to punish him. When Chandradeva asked why, Baba said, Everyone makes mistakes, Chandradeva. To err is human. But some of these people are criminals. They require harsh measures. Otherwise, they won't change. At any rate, I am thinking that from now on, I will start calling people for private sessions and scold them and punish them at that time. A few days later, Baba announced a system of personal contact. Every disciple, he explained, would have the right to one private personal contact with the Guru. What Baba didn't announce, but what everybody knew, was that nothing remained hidden from the Master. Whoever wanted to have personal contact had best come prepared. One evening, Acharya Raghunath and some other Margis were sitting with Baba on the tiger's grave when a strange man approached in the garb of a forest ascetic. Baba mentioned for the Margis to make room for him, but instead of sitting on the grave, he sat on the ground directly in front of Baba. For several minutes, the man stared silently at Baba. The Margis remained silent as well until the man closed his eyes and entered into a state of trance. Then they asked Baba about him. Baba told them that he was their brother disciple and then changed the subject. Nearly two hours passed before the yogi came out of his trance. When he did, he prostrated in front of Baba and left. A few weeks later, Raghunath was again walking in the field with Baba and two other margis. Baba suddenly stopped and brought his folded hands to his heart, just as he normally did when responding to someone's namaskar. His mood turned grave, and he resumed walking slowly and silently. After a few minutes, he turned to Raghunath and said, Do you remember that night when a man came to meet me at the grave and went into deep samadhi for a long time? You were very curious to know who he was. I remember, Baba. He is free from all mundane and supramundane bondages now. He left his physical body a few minutes ago. When he came to see me that day, he had come to seek permission to leave his body. After pausing for a few moments, visibly moved, Baba said, He was a great yogi and a tantric. He had experienced many kinds of samadhi. It was not uncommon in those days for unknown yogis and tantrics to visit Baba. From time to time, the Margis would see one of them waiting for Baba in the field. On such occasions, Baba would generally ask Margis to wait for him and then disappear with that person in the direction of Death Valley or Kalipahar. When the disciples asked him about it, he explained that he had other initiates who were not members of Ananda Marga. They have other work to do outside the organization, he told them. But no other information was forthcoming. And Baba never let the Margis meet any of those unknown ascetics. One evening, Nagina, Lalan, and Vindhya Chalpande were accompanying Baba on field walk. As they passed a covert leading to the field, they saw an unknown man standing there with white, tangled hair and long white beard and ragged clothes. He approached Baba with his hands raised and cried out, Jai Shiva Shankar, O Lord, many days have passed 
in anxious waiting. Baba signaled for the old man to follow them. He continued talking to his three disciples in a light mood, keeping up the conversation until they reached the tiger's grave. Once at the tiger's grave, Baba's mood turned serious. Look, you all get to see me whenever you want, but this poor man has been waiting for many days without having any opportunity to talk to me. He has something very urgent to discuss with me. You should all go back now, so he and I can talk. There is no sense in wasting your time here. The three disciples were disappointed, but they had no choice. As they began walking back towards town, they discussed a strange sadhu. Before they had gone more than a few hundred meters, they decided that this would be a perfect opportunity to catch one of these strange visitors and find out what his relationship was with the master. They doubled back and hid themselves at three different spots, spaced far enough apart that the stranger would have to pass one of them on his way out of the field. Once he had finished his conversation with Baba, they would catch up with him and satisfy their curiosity. It was just after eight when they took up their posts. Baba normally remained at the tiger's grave until 10 or 10.30. 10 o'clock passed, then 11, and soon it was getting near midnight, and there was no sign of either Baba or the mysterious stranger. Finally, one of the three spies lost patience and started walking toward the grave. He found it empty. Baffled, he informed his two fellow disciples, and they returned to town. A couple of days later, Nagina again had the chance to go on field walk with Baba. As they were walking, Baba turned to Nagina and asked, Nagina, if I am not mistaken, after you left the other night, the three of you made plans to catch the sadhu who came to talk to me. Were you able to meet him? Did you find out what you wanted to know? No, Baba, Nagina said softly. We kept watch until midnight, but somehow he slipped by us. Baba smiled. There were only three of you, had you been three hundred, and all on horseback. You still would not have been able to catch him, not unless he wanted you to. He was that elevated a soul. Nagina begged Baba to tell him who the man was, and after a minute or two, Baba acquiesced. That old man is a very advanced sadhaka. He has been practicing sadhana very diligently for many years. He is a resident of Viratnagar in Nepal. His spiritual practice is almost complete, and now he wishes to leave his physical body. He came here to ask me for permission. But why does he need permission? That is the rule. If any sadhaka wishes to leave their physical body, they must seek permission from Sadguru. Did you give him permission? No, I did not. He has a duty to perform. Only after he completes the assigned duty will I allow him to leave his body. What duty is that? I have made a new rule. Before any sadhaka can give up their body, they must render social service. No matter how great a spiritualist they may be, they must return the debt they owe society. He had not yet fulfilled that condition. So I told him that he would have to do rigorous social service for three months. And he agreed? You see, Nagina, when someone exhausts their samskaras, they find it painful to remain in their body. He begged me to reduce the time, so I reduced it to one month. Still, he wouldn't accept it. So I reduced it to two weeks, but even that was too much. So I reduced it to five days, but still he appealed for mercy. So I made one final concession. I reduced the term to three days. What service does he have to do? That I cannot reveal. The next day, the news came that the body of an old sadhu had been found near the tunnel that runs between Jamalpur and Bagalpur. Some days later, Haragobind, who had heard the story from Nagina, asked Baba if the old sadhu, who had been found near the railway tunnel, was the same person who had come to see him three nights before. Yes, he was at Sadaka from Viratnagar. He has fulfilled all his duties in this life and merge with the Supreme Consciousness. As time went on, some of the Margis took to calling these unknown disciples the Brahma Avadutas. Stories of their sightings were passed around, 
but no one ever got a chance to talk to one of them face to face. In a DMC held at Monger in May of 1957, Gayatri, one of Ram Kilivan's four daughters, arrived early and took a seat near the front. She noticed a group of twenty or so ascetic monks seated in front of the dais with their hands upraised. They had tangled locks and wore either robes or animal skins around their waist. Their kamadal pots were on the ground by their feet. She watched them curiously for five or ten minutes and then turned her attention elsewhere. When she looked back a few minutes later, she was surprised to find that they were gone. Gayatri didn't think much more of it until 15 years later when Bindeshwari stopped by her house to pay a visit. In the course of their conversation, he mentioned the Brahma Abadutas. When she heard his description, she recalled this incident. Bindeshwari told her that the monks Baba had initiated before creating Ananda Marga used to do pranam by raising their hands. They would occasionally attend the MC, but they had the power to remain unnoticed. It was Baba's grace, he told her, that she was able to see them. Gayatri's glimpse of these unknown disciples was about as close as any of the Margis ever came to meeting them. Thank you.